बिस्मिल्लाहमान रहीम आज हम आपको एक बड़ा मुनफरद गुफ्तु इंटरव्यू की सूरत में सुनाते हैं जो कि एक अंडर ग्रेजुएट स्टूडेंट स्क्विंट के बारे में अपने टीचर से करता है तो फर्स्ट आई एम गोइंग टू एक्सप्लेन द लिटल ओवर व्यू ऑफ स्क्विंट टू द स्टूडेंट and then he will be allowed to directly interact and answer the questions uh, and ask the questions which will be discussing so what is strabismus then strabismus is a misalignment of the eyes right when the eye is not focused on the same object of regard when the both eyes are not focused on the same object of regard it is misaligned or squinted eye what is object of regard anything this is an object both the eyes are focused on this object so at the moment this is object of the regard ji and if you keep it down and the your eye is focused on the door knob so now the door knob is the object of the regard so that door knob is a kind of far object and this near object fluorescent marker in my hand is a kind of near object so this is near fixation that is far fixation so the squint is here when both eyes of the patient are not focused on same object of the eye okay cross eye is known as squint misalignment of the eyes is squint a very simple definition so this is a little bit more detailed definition squint is a disorder in which one eye misaligns with the other when focusing in a primary direction of gaze and it is generally there because of the in coordination in the extraocular muscles so that shows that it is prudent to just quickly go grow through go through the anatomy so these are the basically extraocular muscles this is a medial rectus muscle which adducts side lateral rectus muscle abducts this rotates the eye superiorly superior rectus and this is inferior rectus which moves the eye in downward direction and these are the two oblique muscles which insert obliquely as you know the superior oblique originates from the orbital apex and then is reflected back through the trochlea and the supramedial part of the orbit and inserts behind the equator so that's important these two obliques they insert yeah. behind the equator of the eye correct so what, what is equator by the way yeah that so equator of any sphere is there a line which joins the points on the maximum convexity of the sphere is known as equator See? this is a sphere it is not necessary that it is exactly in the half of the sphere no yes. because if the kind of uh, elliptical appearance yes if it is oval or like an egg then the equator will be not in the center it will be center only in case of a an ideal sphere right so equator is here in case of eyeball about 13 mm posterior to limbus so these two obliques as you can see here they are inserted behind the equator it reflects back the superior oblique passes underneath the rectus superior rectus muscle and inserts behind the equator but inferior oblique as you can see here so both the obliques are lying inferior to their respective right side oh just to remember yes. both the obliques pass inferior to their respective right side So inferior oblique passes below the inferior rectus muscle 
and then goes absurd behind the equator and almost it inserts a place temporal part of the eye where macula is located oh all right so while handling the inferior oblique insertion one needs to be very careful because it is very very near to the center of vn known as macula so this was a little bit about the anatomy of the intraocular muscles so naturally the horizontal and vertical recti because they are inserted anterior to the uterus so they contract the eye moves in the direction of the contraction of the muscle but the interesting thing about the bleak is because from anterior part they are going back behind the equator yes so once they contract the eye moves in opposite direction superior oblique depresses and inferior oblique elevates so that's the reason behind it just because they are inserted behind the equator what do you mean by torsion and extorsion in torsion and extorsion is a movement which is in which the eye bar rotates around anterior posterior axis okay so these are this is vertical axis this is horizontal axis so this movement horizontal movement is along vertical axis yes. and the superior inferior movement is along the horizontal, horizontal axis. axis so if the axis passes right through the center yes then this then this is in torsion and this is extorsion so these are known as secondary actions of the oblique muscles so this was a little about the then there is a spiral of tillux as well you know this is 5.5 mm behind the limbus spiral of tillux from medial rectus 5.5 inferior rectus 6.5 this is 6.7 and then this is about 7 plus mm behind the limbus like a spiral the movements uh, the so this this is isotropia or convergence point and this is exotropia or divergence point once the eye is deviated vertically this is vertical deviation and if it moves up this is hyper deviation or hypertrophy hypertropia and this is hypotropia so this is the general and the cardinal axis of the case you know extra flow movements the kind of h u form while checking the extra flow movements so these the muscles we have already discussed there are six extra flow muscles around the eye in which uh, four are straight forward anterior to the equator two are inserted behind the equator what are their actions medial rectus action the adduction. primary action is adduction lateral rectus action primary action is abduction superior rectus elevation inferior rectus superior rectus secondary action secondary action of the superior rectus muscle are adduction. elevation Uh, secondary is adduction oh uh, yes and adduction secondary is adduction and there is intorsion as well superior is intort and then yes superior is extort superior is intort and inferior is extort extort obliques abduct and recti adduct or abd and rad obliques abduct and recti adduct adduct so these are the primary and secondary actions superior is intort and inferior is extort so then you can all classify this the actions of the intraocular muscles if we just remember their primary actions and then remember these few lines oblique abduct recti adduct superior is intort inferior is extort 
then you can remember the second reaction as well. The two obliques are abductors. The two recti are adductors. The two superiors are intortors. And the two inferiors are extortors. extortors. So these are the extraocular movements. You know very well that you actually check the primary action of every muscle where it is maximally active. That's the concept behind these extra flow movements in which you kind of form like an X. Just moving along the horizontal axis. And then in the oblique directions. Yes. Right. So th these are known as cardinal axis of gaze. Origin of the extractal muscles is from the annulus of Zen, except inferior oblique. This is annulus of Zen, right at the orbital apex, except inferior oblique, which originates from orbital flow. Orbital flow. Insertion, we have already discussed. This is spiral of Tillux, 5.5, 6.5, 6.9, and 7.7. .7. Right from medial rectus, it moves, keeps on moving away from the limbus. So that's a thing you need to memorize. This is known as spiral of Tillux. Any cl clinical significance of this? Just to, because you have to know the insertion if you are performing surgery. And the significance is that uh, the more posterior they are from the limbus, the inside structures become more and more important. Medial rectus is near to the limbus, so the retina is a little just starting here. Mm -hmm. And the superior rectus is right where the retina, the retina is here underneath. So this is how you are more careful while watching their sutures and uh, cutting their insertions mm -hmm. and isolating their tendons during the surgery. So I, I would like you, because we are recording the interview, I would like you to ask in a clear voice, loud voice, whatever you ask, so that uh, our audience can also benefit from this uh, interaction. Blood supply, they are supplied by two anterior ciliary arteries, except the later rectus muscle, which is supplied by only one. Rest of them are supplied by the two ciliary arteries. They are the branches of a thermic artery, right? Yeah. Then nerve supply, you know, SO4, LR6, LR6. the rest of them are supplied by the third nerve, oculomotor nerve. The superior oblique is supplied by the fourth nerve and the later rectus is supplied by the sixth nerve. sixth nerve. So this is a little table to memorize these things. So this is one video which I recorded during my first Chinese visit of Beijing in 2010 above. So as we already mentioned, internal deviation is convergent squint, external deviation is divergent squint, superior deviation is hyperdeviation or hypertrophia, inferior deviation is hyperdeviation or hypotropia. hypotropia. Committent squint is when if the measurement of the squint remains same in all the cardinal axis of gaze, that is committent squint. And if it, and if it differs in different Position of gaze, then it is incompetent or no. paralytic squint or non committent squint. What's meant by competency? This is just a kind of uh, uniformity, just a term which commits to a certain standard parameter is competent <laughs> and which doesn't commit to a certain 
standard degree it is in competent or non competent then there is a constancy or a, a kind of if the squint is present all the time it is constant squint and if it is present sometime and at other time the eyes are straight it is intermittent intermittent squint as simple as that then the onset if it is right there right from the childhood it is congenital but interesting thing is that necessarily it should not generally we use the term congenital by birth but for squint any squint which starts within first six months of age we label it as congenital and acquired is the adult squint then congenital basically is the same thing as i i actually read infantile squint yes infantile means infant is the one year of age so that is infantile isotropia congenital isotropia are the same terms Unilateral means the one eye is constantly squinting. Alternate means the both eyes squint alternatively. So, in your opinion, which squint is better as long as the prognosis or outcome of the surgery is concerned? What do you think? Alternating or a constant uh, one eye squinting, which should be the better choice? Okay, no problem. Alternating, alternating is squint. Better. Because alternation shows that the eyes are competent. They are uh, equally focusing, equally powered. Only then there will be alternate. Lesser chances of amblyopia in this one. Yeah, that's the point. Lesser chances of amblyopia, more chances of alignment with our right. maneuvers, interventions. Patching and occlusion. Yeah. Generally, the alternating squint will patching will not be indicated because the hope most probably the VN may be equal. The patching may be required more in cases of unilateral yeah, squint. Right. But this is not a rule general. So, what is pseudo strabismus? If it appears to be squinting while you look at the face of the child because of the facial configurations. Because of the Chinese look, like depressed nasal bridge, epicanthal wider intercanthal difference, epicanthal folds, then it is pseudo strip. Because on cover test, there will be actually no deviation. Yeah. Manifest tropia is which is here all the time. It is just a kind of you can say the intermittent squint and constant squint. So, if you want to see whether this patient has some intermittent deviation, now the patient is focusing and both the either straight. How would you know that? That's what the latent squint is. Latent squint, which is hidden and which we can express in our clinical settings with the help of certain tests, tests is latent squint and density of squint basically yes is there hidden which can, but it is there and which is there all the time expressed is manifest, manifest. see this is a typical case of pseudo squint epicanthal folds are very prominent there is telecanthus the distance between both of the medial canthi is greater, depressed nasal bridge. So it is a case of pseudo strabismus because if you can notice the corneal reflection test, it is exactly in the center. Yes. That is Hirschberg test. So this is pseudo strabismus. So what are the objectives of the screen treatment? is to restore because if the both eyes are not focusing and not uh, have got retinal rivalry then there will be no stereopsis that is three dimensional oh, yes perception of the third dimension uh, can you please insert that wire into the power 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then the second objective is to prevent amblyopia, that is lazy eye, and prevent confusion and diplopia in adult cases, especially because the adults, you know, cannot adopt very quickly. Right. And to improve the appearance, cosmetics. This cosmetic appearance is one of the major objectives of squid surgery because it's uh, the eyes or the most attractive uh, kind of fixation point for anybody in the society, in anybody's face. So that's why it is important to keep the eyes aligned cosmetically. So this is as we discussed. What is amblyopia? Amblyopia is unilateral bilateral decrease of VN caused from visual deprivation or abnormal binocular interaction with no obvious cause, no organic cause on clinical examination. The main types are strabismic and strabismus, which is the bias. squint developed first, and then the eye got amblyopia. That is strabismic amblyopia, in which deviation will become will be there first, and then the amblyopia will develop. develop. And isometropic amblyopia is when there is a difference with, of uh, refractive error between two eyes. That is known as an isometropia. Emetropia is when both the eyes or have got no refractive error. That is emetropia. If the eye has got plus refractive error, that is hyperopia. And if eye has got minus refractive error, that is myopia. And if there is difference of power between refractive power of the two eyes, that is an isometropia. So this can be one cause of the squint. So deprivation amblyopia is caused by any deprivation because of the refractive error or the formula of acidity, even cross-tosis can give rise to deprivation amblyopia in which the retina or the visual system is deprived of clear image formation due to any reason any blockage in the media that is deprivation and myopia. So we used to have three Ds, I think, defocused, deprived, deviated. Oh, I remember it. So these are the main three reasons of myopia are either the eye is defocused or deprived, deprived because of the media opacities or doses or something else or deviated. deviated. So if the eye is deviated, that will be strabismic and We have already discussed, what is the difference between confusion and diplopia? Confusion is a simultaneous appreciation of two superimposed but dissimilar images. While diplopia is appreciation of two images of one object. Okay, you see, if if there are two objects, okay, there are two objects, you see. and the image received is both the images are superimposed on each other. That's confusion. That's confusion. Or there is one object, but there is a kind of distortion in the image of that object. And uh, but in diplopia, there will be two definitive images of the same object. That is diplopia. That is diplopia. What's metamorphosia? Metamorphopsia. Opsia. That is distortion of the image. That is because of the maculopathology. That come, doesn't come in the domain of strabismus. That is a kind of macular problem. It is the metamorphopsia or dysphotopsia or micropsia or macropsia. These are the terms which we use to explain distorted macular VN. 
micropsia is the perception of some object smaller, smaller than its real image size that is micropsia that will be there if the difference between my the macular cones is increased because of edema it will give rise to micropsia if the because of the scarring the distance between the cones is decreased it will give rise to necropsia so that so that that is not the case in case here confusion and diplopia is important and uh, it is entirely a full lecture which is about the retinal correspondence and anomalous retinal correspondence that is i think it is beyond uh, the scope of undergraduate level to go in that detail but only you remember is that confusion is the simultaneous appreciation of two superimposed but dissimilar images caused by stimulation of corresponding points by images of different objects different if one object two images it is diplopia yes if two objects two images but superimposed confusing each other in the brain that is confusion yes. one object two images diplopia two objects superimposed distorted confusion okay okay the reason true diplopia is always there because of the one of the muscles is not functioning properly it is always extra glow muscle will be at fault whatever the reason whereas confusion is there because of the optical illusions and because of the retinal correspondence you see this is one object this is known as object of regard it is focused on the fovea of each eye and the brain is able to fuse these two images images and can see one image this is known as binocular single vision and this process is known as fusion fusion so if the fusion is broken then two feelings can be there one this is a triangle this is red circle one eye fovea is focused on triangle the other eye fovea or the macula or the center of vision is focused on red circle because of misalignment of the eyes so both the eyes are not focused on same object same of object. regard that's what the squint is what happens the brain is now forced to fuse triangle with the circle, circle. so two objects superimposed fused give rise to confusion confusion object is one but one eye is getting it on fovea yes. seeing it sharp the other eye is getting it on some extra foveal area mm. and is receiving a little stimulation as compared to this sharp image it is a little dull but same image in different projected in different place in the space so this fovea is corresponding with extra foveal area of the other eye. other eye that is anomalous or abnormal retinal correspondence and giving rise to diplopia two images of the same object that is diplopia now you get confusion and diplopia yes i do so appearance is very important you see cosmetic clinical examination deviation age of onset 
as we discussed infantile congenital or later on may be acquired history of trauma as well yes for the current description of deviation previous treatments is, is, was there any reason in the pre or postnatal period of that particular child to develop squint growth and development family history abnormal head postures squint examination eye examination always starts with real activity measurements and then you do the refraction as well and then you assess the amblyopia amblyopia testing how is it done you just measure the real activity and the refraction that's the first thing we will know about the anisometropic amblyopia and then the whole of clinical examination will explain whether this difference of vision between two eyes is explainable by some retinal pathology or not whether this amblyopia is which d is there defocused deprived or deviated deviated so this is amblyopia testing by simple clinical methods and then there are uh, gadgets as well in which uh, you can uh, further classify it in orthoptic rooms motor exam extraocular movements motor functions of the eye then you will do the cover test to classify between foreas and tropias convergence and accommodation near reflex you will see because the congenital or infantile is atrophia yes. you will have to measure whether the there is high ac over a ratio yeah i wanted to ask that what was that so i think it will come in the later slide but i just tell you that you i'm looking at the clock now so that's the four object yes now i'm trying to read what is written on this fluorescent and marker so the eyes have converged both of them to read and focus at the near object right at the same time there is pupillary constriction at the same time there is accommodation of the ciliary muscle to focus so these three things are known as part of near reflex reflex so that shows that uh, this accommodation and the uh, convergence are related to each other yes they are so one day after of accommodation gave rise to certain prism diopters of convergence all right the unit of convergence is prism, prism diopters and unit of accommodation is the diopters that is just a lens power lens power so one day after of accommodation may give rise to six diopter of convergence prism six prism diopters of convergence yes. so that is ac over a ratio accommodator convergence over accommodation ratio so now this is normal and if one day after accommodation give rise to 12 day after accommodator convergence this is high ac over a ratio and the tendency will be to get isotropia isotropia is convergence convergence patterns and if one day after of accommodation just gave rise to three day after prism day after of accommodators and the students this is decreased as you over a ratio yes and the patient may have Excellent. convergence insufficiency okay on one part is convergence excess on the other pole is insufficiency convergence insufficiency both can so this is a concept of accommodation and its relationship to Accommodator convergence is AC over A ratio. Now, 
Measurement of deviation is done at the distance in the near with glasses and without glasses, because the glasses can make the difference. Sensory tests are there with the worth four dot, te dot test. That is a we'll see in the later slides. Uh, red green goggle the wall, and then the four dots are presented to the patient, and it is a very good test to classify between confusion and diplopia. That's known as worth four dot test. We can measure the stereopsis with the fly test and our reading cards. Then the fixation, we will have to classify it whether it is monocular, alternating or binocular fixation with the help of cover and uncover tests. Straight lamp examination will just complete our examination of the media and other things to rule out any organic pathology. Fundus examination is of utmost importance because uh, it is the retina from where the viewer process starts. Cycloplegic refraction, because it is related to anisometropia and measurement of refractions, so cycloplegic refraction is of great importance. Uh, I would like to know from uh, Mr. Noman whether the recording is good. Okay, thank you. Shukriya. So cycloplegic refraction is very important to know the actual status of the refraction of that particular patient. We have to cycloplege the ciliary muscle yes. with the help of cycloplegic agents like atropine and cyclopentolate. In our clinical setting these days, we seldom use cyclopene, we use cyclopen because it is short acting. It's one drop of atropine, it will give rise uh, the duration of action is two weeks. Mm. The what's patient the, will not be able to read and write. There, there's a question in my mind. What's penalization process in uh, treating strabismus, the phoria? That is you in, in with your own plan, you paralyze the accommodation okay. for a certain period of time by low dose. Atropine. Yes, that is penalization. And uh, recently, a similar kind of treatment is being reported to be successful to stop or to decrease the progression of myopia as well. Very low dose that routine is used so that the child is not able to accommodate. Okay. And uh, the researchers uh, from Singapore have reported that it helps to stop the progression of myopia in young kids. Okay. But to clinically, we use these things very less. Really. Cornea reflection test, very simple. Hushbrook test. Uh, uh, dear Noman, can you give me the torch so that I can show the cornea reflection test to this student? Just torch, please. Uh, please bring the thermoscope as well. I appreciate your help. Thank you, Mr. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And will, will you please come here in front of the camera between two of us so that I can just show the students practically. Please keep sitting. Don't, don't, don't you move, please. Please, please come here. The first you see, this is the eye. And you shine the light directly into the eye and look for a reflection on the cornea. That is simple corneal reflection test, right? And it is also known as Hirschberg test. Uh, Mr. Numan, please come here. Please, please, keep stand, stay, stay straight and look at a distant object. Can you please bring the chair so that you can sit here? Because you see, it will 
clarify more with the help of our respected assistant, Mr. Numan. Mr. Numan, you please look at uh, that knob of that cupboard, okay? So that that is a distant object. So, and the patient is looking at a far point and we shine the light. Please don't look into the light. Please look at distant object. And we look for corneal reflection. Corneal reflection. That is corneal reflection test. And just simply looking at the reflection, if it is centered in both the eyes, the patient is orthophoric. Ortho. That is one thing. Patient is looking at far. Mr. Numan, will you please look into this? Yes, tip of this fluorescent marker. So now the patient is looking at the near object and we are again focusing on the corneal reflection. So this is how it worked as per near and far. That is corneal reflection test. Thank you, Mr. Numan. <laughs> What's the significance of uh, using this uh, test for near vision as well? Because sometimes, as we have discussed already, accommodative convergence and other things, the patient may be orthophoric for distance and maybe squinting for near because near of vision. high AC over A ratio. Or so, maybe the patient may have some little divergence squint for near because of the decreased AC over A ratio. So that's why it is important to measure the deviation at both distance and near. So this was corneal reflection test. As you see here in this slide, the reflection is right in the center. In the other eye, it is the eye is deviated in, and the reflection is clear at between the pupil and the center of the cornea. How do we measure with the help of this test? I just read that we can also measure. Yes, that. we measure just uh, if it is center, it is orthophoric, and if it is at the pupillary margin, it is about 15 degrees of the squint. All right. And if it is degrees between the pupillary degrees. margin and the limbus, it is about 30 degrees of the squint. And if it is, it is at the limbus, it is roughly 45 degrees of the squint. So, this okay. is how we measure the squint by a simple Hirschberg test pseudo squint. See, the examiner is pinching the nose so that the intercanthal distance is decreased. And now the reflection is right in the center. So that's, this is how we show the mothers, assure them that uh, you, this is because of the depressed nasal bridge or pina knock. Chinese look. Chinese look. So VN test in adults, you know, we can check the VN in kids. We have just we see whether they follow or fix on the light we can use toys and these are the various cards and special tests designed to measure the real potential or equity of the kids but generally we just project the light and see whether the child can pick up the light and follows it that is known as csm central steady maintained this is how we write for kids okay, that the child is able to pick the light in the center and maintains and follows the light that's very gives very good and authentic information so pediatric assessment can be done in one to two years of age and then there is coin test and toys test thing being uh, an undergraduate student this is not very important but just we have included it to sensitize you that the, in pediatric age group the method used will be different, different methods sensory tests you see the patient is being red green goggles the four dots are being projected on the new in the chart one center one is red and the two on the green and the lower one is white white simple white light 
and these are the polarized glasses. Red receives only red wavelength and green receives only green wavelength. green wavelength. So if the patient is seeing all the four dots with the lower dot being pink or alternating the colors between green and red, that shows normal retinal correspondence and good retinal rivalry. Rivalry means, rival means that enemy. enemy. Okay. Retina is rival to each other in which sense? Both of the retina are competent, the patient is emetrope, and both the eyes are trying to pick the sharper image of the object. Both the retina are trying to get the best of the image of the object. And they are competing each other, fighting each other. That's retinal rivalry. So if this central dot is pink or changing colors between red and green, so that shows that both of the retina are trying to pick. That's normal. normal. Okay. If, excuse me, I have called from my brother. Just give me a little. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my dear brother, I'm actually conducting a one to one session with the uh, undergraduate student Abdullah Mazhari, and uh, we are recording it on Zoom. I call you very shortly. Thank you. Thank you. So this is known as normal retinal correspondence. And if the patient is perceiving only two red dots, that shows right eye is active and left has got suppression. So this, this is worth four dot test. And if the patient receives only three green dots, no red, no. that shows the left is active and right, right has got right. suppression. And if there are five dots instead of four, that is diplopia. Diplopia. So this was worth four dot test. Then these are striated glasses. These are synapto four. These are all fine testing tools. There is a test known as froze four prism diopter test, base out test. Four diopter of the prism is used. Base doubt is placed in front of one eye and the opposite eye is observed. It is another fine condition with the name of monofixation syndrome. It is microisotropia, which is detected by four diopter prism base out test. Four diopter prism base out test. Bego leading glasses are there. You just need to remember that there, there are fine clinical tests as well. Stereo optic test, the most common is Titmus fly test. It is a simple book. Polarized glasses are worn by the patient. And then the various objects are, patient is asked to see and report. And accordingly, the graded. stereo optic is graded. TNO test is also same. Frisbee, two pencil test. You, this is a titmus fly test. This is TNO test. Lang test. These are stereopsis tests. Then we observe very closely the head postures. If there is head tilt, right side, head tilt, left side, or vertical kind of compensation or head nodding we observe all these things because they can be associated with strabismus so why the head will be tilted or rotated because you know the squint gives rise to certain things which we have discussed confusion and diplopia like things so if there is squint the 
natural reflex will be to compensate for it to project the eye again on the same object of regard that's why these compensatory head postures are there if right lateral rectus muscle is paralyzed this eye cannot move out right eye so the patient will compensate by turning his head towards right towards right so that the eye doesn't need to move so this is a simple mechanism by which these compensatory so head that postures object are there the, that field of region of there may be chin elevation or depression there may be face turn and there may be head okay. tilt generally it is more important and considered diagnostic in case of superior oblique palsies as compared to other muscles we generally find out superior oblique palsy with these head tilt and turn tests test to measure deviation one we have already discussed is hirschberg test corneal reflection test then this is cover test you simply cover one eye and then there is alternate cover test prism bar test these tests are based on the principle of dissociation right from all these tests except the hirschberg test or based on principle of dissociation that with any means by a simple cover or by certain instruments or by certain optical lenses if the two eyes you make them to focus on different objects dissimilar images targets and the patient sensory system is expected or asked to fuse these dissimilar targets into one this is known as dissociation you cover one eye one eye is seeing the cover the other eye is seeing a distant or a near target so dissimilarity dissociation you put maddox rod in front of one eye again same we will see in later slides that is the principle is dissociation. dissociation then we check the variance which variance is checking of the movements of the both eyes duction is the checking of movements extra flow movements of one eye the here point of convergence we can use raf rule that is a simple ruler with the measurements written over it and we ask the patient for diplopia and for uh, till what distance the patient can see the clear object and we can document it for near point of accommodation and convergence convergent, both can be documented by use of okay. raf rule fusional amplitudes can be measured with prism bars or synoptophore synoptophore is just an instrument with two tubes the eye is seen through the tubes one tube has got the image of the line the other tube has got image of the cage okay. so patient has to put line into the cage all right that is known as a glioscope as well you simply have two tubes okay. with two dissimilar but associated images line and cage is a simple association but the images are dissimilar if the patient is able to put the line into the cage that shows good fusion if the cage and the lines remain separate that's a different so this is the concept of amblyoscope or synoptophore Sorry. then there is has test in which again red green goggles and the red green targets are used to dissociate the eyes and on a board the targets are displayed at different positions of the gaze and the patient has kind of torch in his hand to follow that target with the pointer and the observer records all that 
response on the piece of paper that is known as has yes. test or has chart similarly there is lean screen in which mirror is used but the principle remains same and again the principle of has test test is dissociation dissociation so remember it amblyopia as we discussed it is defocused deprived or deviated deviated eye giving rise to poor vision in one eye without any organic cause and the treatment is with occlusion of the healthy eye yes and penalization as you asked yes and then there are you need to find out the exact refraction and offer the corrective glasses as well so now we move to clinical tests see this is a cover test the one eye is covered okay this is cover uncover test and hirschberg test both the reflections are in the center so it is orthophoric and on cover uncover test there is no deviation so patient is orthophoric and if on cover uncover test once the eyes are dissociated the eye moves in that is esophoria esophoria because it was appearing orthophoric only we covered it and then it got internally deviated so it is not tropia it is esophoria documented by cover uncover test so only seen when eye is covered often asymptomatic there are no complaints and the left eye doesn't move od we use for right eye os we use for left eye this was esophoria again cover uncover test in this case we are checking exophoria the cover comes in front of the eye the eye moves out under the cover after dissociation this is exophoria only seen when eye is covered the left eye doesn't move the eye under cover moves this is cover uncover you cover one eye you remove the cover and you see it this is cover uncover what's alternate cover now the cover will alternate between two eyes that's why it is alternate, alternate cover. cover test and alternate this is alternate exophoria exophoria the under cover eye deviates and the eye which is not covered comes focus on the object is that possible and it is exotropia because the eye is constantly deviating out out this is exotropia may be visible without cover test constant test may have intermittent diplopia ye possibility hai ki ek eye mein tropia aur ek mein phoria ho the or this is not one eye squint is imbalance between two eyes squint is imbalance between two eyes if there is no other eye there is no squint okay. so it is a not one eye problem yes. it is always as compared to other eye so both eyes have to be there for uh, these common squint issues except restrictive or paralytic squint can you tell me about the primary gaze and the secondary gaze right what's the difference primary gaze is when the patient is looking straight ahead at the same object of regard in far position that's the primary gaze looking straight ahead is primary gaze Mr. Numan, please come in the center again. Thank you. And uh, look to that door knob. So this is primary gaze. And Mr. Numan, please 
Now look towards this tip of this marker. These are all secondary positions of gaze. Okay. And what's primary deviation and secondary deviation? Wow. They, they are used to differentiate between paralytic and non paralytic. We will come to paralytic splint. We are at the moment discussing committent splint. We will come to that as well. So now we have seen the isotropia. Now we are examining exotropia. Why it is exotropia? Because the eye is deviated out and the reflection is here nasally. So it is constant exotropia. What we, we will test? Deviated eye or the straight eye in case of manifest squint? Straight, straight eye. eye. It will move in the deviated eye. Yeah, yeah perfect. We cover it. So the eye moves in. We, we are alternating. Both eyes keep on shifting. So this is alternate exotropia. But we will see right at right exotropia. Because the right eye is constantly deviating. Left. And we can use two prisms to quantitate squint. You will see. We do simple cover, uncover test. And then we bring prism. In front of the eye. So remember about the prism. Prism is always used or classified with respect to its base and apex. So apex will be directed to the direction of the deviation. Apex will be directed to the direction, direction of the deviation. For example, we are measuring isotropia. The apex will be directed in and the base out prism will be used to measure it. If we are measuring exotropia, base in prism, base in prism will be used and apex will be directed to the direction of the tropia. So base in prism is placed and the cover test is repeated and there is no movement. The neutralization point is when there is no movement. It may be 15 prism day after 30 prism day after or 45 prism day after. So we will write exotropia 45 prism day after. PD. The prisms of different pores are used. Of different PDs of, all right. Now you can see it more elaborated alternate cover test how it is clinically being performed you see this is a video showing alternate cover test the cover keeps on moving between two eyes and we keep on observing lack of motion in other eye indicates normal ocular alignment or orthophoria there is no Phoria, no tropia. Just go through it again. The patient is apparently looking straight ahead, as Mr. Noman showed you. And then the cover is being moved alternatively between two eyes. And there is no movement is detected. This shows normal ocular alignment or orthophoria. orthophoria. This is primary position of face. What will happen? When there is iso deviation, you see. This is prism cover test. The eye undercover moves in. 
and once the cover is removed it comes back it comes so this we have induced the schizophrenia to show you with help of a prism if it can correct it can induce as well because we know from right from our knowledge of physics from the light chapters of intermediate that the image is displaced towards the apex that right light ray which strikes a prism and deviates down and we trace the image we trace the image it is moved towards the apex the path of the light bent towards the base and the image always moves towards the apex so that's what is being used in prism cover test alternate cover test for exo deviation it is again simulated the eye under cover will move out and once the cover is removed will come in to pick up the fixation this is exophoria vertical deviation hyper deviation means hypertropia you see the eye under cover moves up and then comes down this is hypertropia hypertropia or hypersphoria hyper deviation you can say we have induced it with prisms and for for vertical deviations the base will be either down or up for horizontal deviations the base will be in or out and the apex will be directed to the direction of the tropia tropia so we have seen it this is left hypertropia simulation so this just i have included the because the pupil examination is very important and you asked me about uh, i think relative afferent pupillary defect this is how would i document it relative afferent pupillary defect is a kind of conduction defect you shine the torch and observe on the pupillary reaction in both eyes both of them constrict equally or on swinging light reflex the size of the pupil remains unchanged we will say the rapd is negative negative, negative. there is a little constriction or the size is unchanged on swinging light reflex just say 1 2 3 4 in one eye and quickly shift it to other eye without any gap and any loop straight like this see if i check the rapd for mr noman please mr noman again look on that tv no better door knob and uh, shine the light in one eye 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 and observe the pupils the amount of constriction or the reflex is same in two eyes so rapd is negative negative this is practical demonstration of corneal right reflex or hirschberg test light source is directed towards the cornea and the cornea is shiny whole corneal surface is, has been checked by just simple reflection this was not hirschberg test this is just demonstration of corneal reflex all around the hirschberg test will be same please look at the distant object mr noman on the door knob you shine the light and you observe both of the central reflection in the body
surface integrity has been checked. This is direct pupillary reflex. You simply shine the light one by one in both eyes and just observe the pupillary reaction. That is direct pupillary reflex. Ocular ductions. This is checking the ocular movements. See, the object is being moved in horizontal direction. Later rectus muscle is being checked. And then medial rectus muscle was checked. Now elevation is being checked. Depression is being checked. So these are the ductions in, in which single eye is checked. Other eyes included. You are not focusing on that. Okay. That's important. Horizontal, abduction, reduction, elevation, depression. depression. And elevation and depression, you can check both nasal side and temporal side. Then it comes the cardinal axis of case. And if you just check it vertically in the center, then you are not isolating the muscle because both the vertical and horizontal muscle are playing their part in the center. To check a particular reduction, you need to check it in cardinal axis of case. So how will you do alternate cover test in isophoria? Simple. Closing the finger, you are blocking one eye and you see under cover the eye deviates in and then once the cover is shifted, it comes back to pick up the fixation. This is alternate cover test for isophoria. By having the patient fixate at a distant or near target as well. I demonstrated one eye is covered by hand or other opaque material. The cover is then moved quickly to cover the other eye, not allowing the patient to see out both eyes together at the same time. The cover is moved back and forth and several times, allowing apple time for the uncovered eye to achieve fixation. That's what I say one, two, three, four. So this is alternate, alternate cover, cover test. Now for exophoria, now cover is being used, the eye under cover moves out and as the cover is shifted to other eye, the eye under cover picks up the fixation and the other eye which is covered moves out. So how do you do it? Can you read that for me? Yes. Please read it loud. Yeah. The alternate of cross cover test is performed by having the patient fix the glass of water. Yeah, target. One eye is covered by the hand or other opaque material. The cover is then moved quickly to cover the other eye, not allowing the patient to see out of the both eyes at the same time. The cover is moved back and forth several times, allowing ample time for the uncovered eye to achieve fixation of the top. The examiner observes the motion, if any, of the eye which has just been uncovered. If there is no movement of either eye, ocular alignment is normal. If the uncovered eye moves inward, then the eye has been turned outward. This misalignment is called as exophoria or exotropia. If the uncovered eye moves outward, then the eye had been turned inward. This misalignment is called as isophoria or isotropia. If the uncovered eye moves downward, then the eye had been turned upward. This misalignment is called as hyperphoria or hypertropia. The alternate cross Cover test will not distinguish between a phoria and a tropia. The cover uncover test will be required to differentiate between these two variations. Thank you. Thank you, You're right. Mr. Abdullah, for reading that for me. You can see it again. The note the inward movement of the eye under cover, the corrective movement of the right eye. Both of the eyes are moving. Thank you. Thank you. 
So what can, can you read that again? Yes. I think we have gone through it. Huh? This is a accommodation reflex. Actually, uh, I, I'm not clear about how to distinguish between uh, the four E and the two E. Yeah, the okay. cover and what's the difference between cover and cover and alternate cover test? If the parents or the attendants or the patient has manifest squint, or they say that the patient has squint, and you also notice on a Hirschberg test that the eye is deviated out or deviated in, then you will start by covering the normal eye. Normal eye. Straight gaze. And you will just by covering the normal eye, you will see what happens to the deviated eye, whether it picks up the fixation or not. And will uncover the straight eye, of course. Yes. After observing the behavior of the deviated eye, now you will remove the cover from the fixating eye. So that is Covered. At that point, you will be observing the eye which you had covered. What happened to it and inside the cover? Okay. That is cover uncover. Covered. It can it is done only in case of generally where there is no manifest. manifest, manifest screen. But it can be done in case of Fourier as well. So difference is just by performance. In simple cover uncover test, you are giving eye ample time to fixate again. But in alternate cover test, the objective and the method or the theme behind the test is the same. But you are not allowing the eye to pick up fixation and fuse, fuse the images again. You are just rapidly shifting it so that the principle of the cover test is dissociation. dissociation. So you don't let the dissociation break. You don't let the eyes associate by switching the cover rapidly. Uh, Mr. Norman, can you bring the cover from our trolley? Thank you. Thank you very much. Please come and have a seat. So this is a cover. Please look at the same distant object at the road map. Cover, uncover. Cover, uncover. For left eye. Cover, uncover. Cover, uncover. For right eye. There is no movement. So even Fourier can be detected by a simple cover, cover uncover cover. test. Because once you cover the eye, if there is phoria, you have broken the association. association. You have dissociated the eyes. The eye under cover may show a little deviation. So that shows that the, even the cover uncover test can detect phoria. Then why alternate cover test is superior to cover uncover test? Because by rapidly shifting the cover between two eyes, like swinging right reflex, you are not allowing the eye to associate again. The time of dissociation is prolonged by rapid switching of the cover. So chances of the hidden squint getting manifest are and more. being noticed clinically are more with alternate cover. But there is no hard line, as some of the observers may narrate, that cover uncover test is meant for tropias and alternate cover test is meant for phorias only. That's what actually creates and leads to confusion in the minds of the students. Both the tests can do the same job because the principle is the same. But alternate cover test proves superior in detecting Fourier. hidden squint or latent squint, known as Fourier. Yes.
so we were at near reflex because all these things have been discussed so it's now ideal to go through their practical demonstrations so near reflex is the accommodation reflex as well as convergence and pupillary constriction meiosis convergence and accommodation are the three arms of the near reflex meiosis is constriction of the pupils convergence is inward turning of the eyes you see the object comes at near and the patient is asked to look at this object the pupil constricts meiosis the eye turns in convergence and the third is accommodation again the object comes the eye turns in the pupil constricts and we know that accommodation occurs to read it to see the near object clearly from infinity the eye has to increase its power of the crispline lens that is near reflex now you will remember it what are the three parts of the near reflex meiosis accommodation convergence perfect perfect mr noman you also get this point and i introduce mr noman he is a student of optometry so it's quite good to have him around us because he understands these terms very well you were asking about the non committent squint yes so this is how it differs because the one of the muscles is paralyzed so the eye is deviated to look like it will be just if for example this is right sixth cranial nerve palsy the eye will be deviated in until we have now asked for the history and other things we will just see that there is isotropia the eye is deviated. convergent deviated in so it is convergent squint because right lateral rectus muscle is not working so what will you do you will cover which eye the normal eye the left eye. left eye and in normal comitant squint the right eye will come in the center because the muscles are fine there is only fine imbalance between the two eyes but now the patient is here with six nerve palsy so you cover the left eye will the right eye come in the center no it depends on the paralysis severity of paralysis severity of paralysis if it's total paralysis it will not move at all if it is partial paralysis may move a little but definitely not like a normal competent squint in a young child so you now you start picking up this is incompetent squint this is some kind of paralysis in part so this was primary deviation but there is a known as the hering's law of equal innervation you will read it in physiology that the brain fires certain amount of energy both eyes to keep them aligned in the movements so that they remain focused on same object of regard in all the positions of gaze so naturally the medial rectus has to coordinate with the lateral rectus for leftward movement right lateral rectus will be active right medial rectus will be relaxed left medial rectus will be contracting left lateral rectus will be relaxed only then both the eyes will coordinate for the left gaze who is doing that Allah Almighty has blessed your brain, who controls and coordinates the extracellular movements, and keeps on doing it for years and years together. So this is coordination. This is competence. 
governed by the brain, your nuclei and their coordination centers. So if the right later rectus is no more working because of the six nerve palsy, and now you covered the straight eye, the energy was fired from the brain to the right eye to bring that right paralytic eye in the center. Yes. But it could not move. So brain fired more energy. More energy. The eye still cannot move because the muscle is no more working. So by our knowledge, we know similar amount of energy is being fired to the left eye to the other eye as well which is a yoke muscle of right lateral rectus medial rectus of left eye so under cover extra energy has been fired to medial rectus of left eye healthy straight eye with normal muscles so once you remove cover from that healthy eye, it will be deviated more medial. than the paralytic primary eye to the medial side. So that is secondary deviation. Primary deviation is in paralytic eye. Secondary deviation is there under cover in normal eye. normal eye and in paralytic squint secondary deviation is greater than primary, primary deviation primary. i hope yeah I you will it. remember it forever thank you so now we see the practical demonstration of right sixth cranial nerve palsy You see, the patient comes with right eye deviation and on extracular movements, it hardly moves out because right lateral rectus muscle is paralyzed. Right. There is absent of abduction in right eye, right eye or very slow abduction. So, of course, if the patient looks away from the direction of paralysis, the amount of deviation will be less. That is incompetence. In different positions of gaze, the amount of deviation differs. That is incompetent squint or paralytic squint. You get my point? In right gaze, it will be different. In left gaze, it will be different. In left gaze, later rectuses will not be required. In right gaze, there is absent abduction in the right eye muscle. This is six no palsy can you tell me the difference between committent and incommitent squint now yes please when okay you just read it we just go back a little from here you see note less isotropia in left gaze because yes. eye is looking away from the peritic muscle and one more isotropy and right gaze because the eye is looking into the direction of the peritic muscle. Note isotropy and primary position. Okay. Primary position is straight ahead. So this is what the committed squint is loss of abduction of right eye. It doesn't move out at all. So it will be more manifest in right gaze as compared to left gaze. That makes it incompetent squint. And now you can read it for me in a loud, clear voice, looking into the camera. Six cranial nerve occlusions palsy. Paralysis of the six cranial nerve abducens results in loss of abduction by the lateral rectus by the lateral rectus muscle. With total paralysis, the eye is isotropic, turned inward in primary position. 
Diplopia is more pronounced in gaze to the side of the weakened lateral rectus, muscle and desk in gaze to the opposite side. With partial paralysis, the diplopia may be noted only in far gaze to the right, to the side of the weakened lateral rectus muscle. What are the common causes? Common causes of sixth nerve paralysis include the following diabetes mellitus, increased intracranial pressure, head trauma, tumors, herpes zoster, nasopharyngeal tumors, that's all. Thank you for the help. So you get the point now? Incompetent squint, primary and secondary deviation. This is how you check the ocular versions. Versions is movement of the both eyes both together. Eyes. Duction is single eye movement. Moves either into the six cardinal positions. As you understand. Left later rectus, right medial rectus, move the target slowly. Right later rectus, left yes, medial rectus, rectus is being evaluated. Right superior rectus, left inferior oblique. Left inferior rectus, right superior oblique. Right inferior rectus, left superior oblique. And straight up and down. Clear? So I think this gives uh, an overall general view of the squint. And the next is, if you like, we can go to a little bit detail of management of piezo and exotropia. Would you like to do that? No, I like to take a bit. Yes. And uh, you can just go through your questions now. And then we take a break. Yes. Why is diplopia infrequent in non paralytic squint? Because non paralytic squint is generally there in youngsters, in kids, and in teenagers, and in small kids. The adaptation reflexes are very good. Sensory adaptation is excellent and they compensate it by suppression. suppression. Suppression, as we noticed, only two green dots or only three red dots, or by anomalous retinal correspondence. So there is no diplopia. Got that. Thank you. And in cases of Adult acquired strabismus, the sensory adaptation reflexes are very poor. So, if the, it is acquired strabismus, the compensatory suppression seldom occurs. So, the patient complains of true diplopia. And true diplopia is always binocular in origin. Simple test to evaluate whether it is true diplopia or not is to cover one eye. If by covering one eye, the diplopia disappears, it is binocular diplopia. The second thing to know about diplopia is whether it is horizontal diplopia or vertical diplopia. Or vertical diplopia. That is again by the history. So please, what next? Okay, um, the rest of the questions I think we have already cleared. Yes, so we can test. just go through it. Prism cover test. Prism cover test we have shown. We use prism to measure the squint, the amount of deviation. And uh, I clear uh, mentioned it very clearly that the effects of the prism is directed to the 
direction of the deviation. deviation. For XO deviation, the apex will be out, base will be in. And generally, we talk with the reference to the base of the prism. For exo deviations, base in prism is used. For iso deviations, base out prism is used. For hypertropia, base down prism is used. And for hypertropia, base up prism base is up used to my ear. And it is combined with cover uncover or alternate cover test. Neutralization point is where there is no shift under cover. The amount of prism used to reach that point is the amount of the deviation deviation and the unit is prism it is okay the next one is an up to four we mentioned yes. that actually it is a kind of amblyoscope or two tubes with two dissimilar but associated images like line and the cage the patient is seeing through the two tubes at the end of the tube there is line at the other end of the tube there is cage so simple the patient with normal fusion will be able to put the line into the cage so this is synaptophore and it is a very refined instrument used for many purposes in orthoptics have you seen the synaptophore in your department not yet yet yes very good so try to understand it is based on the principle of dissociation so we will be learning it from no man very soon treatment for different types of tropias this is what the next section all right maybe sometime yes secondary deviation and primary deviation we have discussed secondary deviation is the deviation in the normal eye under cover and it is because of Herring's law of equal innovation. The normal eyes, yoke muscle of the peritic muscle is being fired more stimuli from the brain. So the healthy eye deviates more than the peritic eye under cover. That's known as secondary deviation is greater than primary deviation, deviation in Paralytic or non-committent or non-committent. So, thank you very much, Mr. Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah, for joining this discussion today. And thank you very much, Mr. Noman, for uh, volunteering for uh, the demonstration of certain tests. And your input as an optometry student was also valuable for us. Thank you very much.